emotions are dead. The eight fixation is perhaps the easiest to understand. Eights are body types who only feel at ease when they have control over the situation. This often leads to them being very confrontational, challenging the world around them, and protecting their autonomy from those who would attempt to subjugate or violate them. Here's the thing. Eights tend to be viewed quite positively in Enneagram circles. More often than not, the eight is understood as the no bullshit fighter with a heart of gold who protects their friends and yada yada, which can be true. But my goal with this series is not to highlight positive characteristics because the Enneagram isn't about positive characteristics. It's about the different types of brokenness. Any positive trait or skill associated with a certain Enneagram fixation is a secondary side effect of the core issue. Fives are said to be very organized and good with abstract ideas. Like, yeah, that'll happen when you spend all of your time Time hiding in your own brain because you're terrified of the outside world. And the eights are tough and protective and forward, but you can't stop there. You have to ask why. How does that serve them? Well, eights come from environments where on some level they had to fight to get their needs met. They learned from a young age that they had to toughen up, which included shutting themselves off to emotion. You can know an eight for years and never see their feelings. It's very rare for them to be vulnerable because in their subconscious mind, vulnerability equals death you got to stay in control. So there's a few typical eight stories, but one of them is about the eight character letting down their defenses and allowing themselves to be vulnerable, usually in the context of parenthood or love. There's a precious, no one has ever seen this side of me quality to eights in these stories. So time heals all wounds, I guess. It wasn't time that did it. The idea of an unexpected soft side is quintessential eightness. Joel Miller's story in The Last of Us is an interesting twist on this because it is the classic eight story of rediscovering his heart, but when he does, it leads him to make a very questionable decision. These are really my favorite kinds of arcs, the morally neutral ones. Instead of thinking of a character changing from bad to good or good to bad, you think in terms of actualization. So the story could end with the character doing a bad thing, but in the context of that character, it's kind of healthy in a weird sort of way, like you're proud of them. But there are two other kinds of eight stories. The second is rising to a position of leadership. See, eight's desire for power doesn't necessarily mean they have world domination plans. It just means they need to have power over their immediate environment. Sometimes that environment is a small group they command, sometimes it's an army of one. Eights will detach from society and become outlaws or hermits. And so this eight becomes a leader story is about this stubborn outlaw eight being called upon to rejoin society. It's the classic western trope of the gunfighter who's going to protect the town. Like, Oh, please, Wolverine, we need you. No, I don't want to. I hate everyone. Oh, but you're so cool. We need you. We need you, Wolverine. The final eight story is the fall from power. This is your Macbeth type, your paranoid ruler desperately trying to hold their empire together. Alonzo Harris from Training Day is among my favorite eights. See, Alonzo beat up a Russian mobster at a casino, and he's trying to hold on to his power by any means necessary. So he kills and steals his way across Los Angeles in an attempt to resolve the situation and pay back the mob. But the more he tightens his grip, the more control slips through his fingers. The people he subjugated rise up against him, he explodes in a pathetic tough guy rant, and then he gets whacked. With all the ultimate badass stereotypes surrounding them, it's important to remember that eights can be just as pathetic as everybody else. Sometimes pure gut energy is the way to get something done, but in a civilized society, you won't get far without diplomacy and compromise. So as the falling eight loses control, they become progressively more alien to people around them. At their lowest, there is no honor, no trust, no friendship just a bull in a china shop. When the eight's life is falling apart, you know. But the eight meltdowns counterpart scene is the eight emotional release, the furiosa scream. Eights need to accept their weakness if they are to grow. That moment when they allow themselves to cry, to be vulnerable, that's a key beat if you're doing a positive eight arc. They gotta let their emotions out. Any variation of gang or mafia culture is also gonna be very eight-coded. Take what's yours, assert power in your environment, etc. I had the pleasure of speaking with a very successful screenwriter, and this guy has a lot of mob connections, mostly dudes in prison, and he told me something about gangsters that I'll never forget. He told me these killers that he knows, they have no ego, and I was shocked by this. So I was like, wait, you're telling me someone like Frank Lucas doesn't have an ego? And he's like, nah. To unpack what he meant, I'm going to talk about Freud stuff, and I'm just going to explain it the way I understand it. So to all the people who are really into that, sorry, not sorry if I don't say everything perfectly. Basically, the three parts of the mind are the id, which is subconscious impulsive desires, the superego, which is the rigid moral voice that tells us what we should do, and the ego, which consciously ties everything together into a unified idea of self. A lot of people think ego just means every form of unpleasantness. So that guy's mean? Oh, 
will say he has a big ego, but really the ego is a neutral force that justifies all of the other factors in a person. Egoing is a skill, so a person who's very good at justifying all of their impulses and emotions and constructing a definition of self that functions within reality, that's what it means to have a truly powerful ego. Ego equals your internal justification machine. And eights suck at this more than any other type, because eights primarily operate from the id, the body, the I want. They're gut types. They're the guttiest gut types. And remember what I said about gut types and dysregulation. No thoughts in that brain. When a three is dysregulated, their ego starts working on overdrive. All of their energy goes into how do I arrange reality in a way that makes me the hero? And they tend to be very good at spinning this lie. You see it across all types to a degree. With a type seven, it would be, I am the most wonderful ray of sunshine and the people who try to introduce negative energy into my life are bad. With a type two, it would be, I am so kind and selfless. I want the best for everybody. But with eights, more often than not, they'll kind of just drop the act and go into their bodies. They're mad. They're going to let it out. Like, have you ever met a really immature eight? They just want the thing and they don't know how to justify it. Their ego is so out of practice. Like, listen to Marty trying to justify his affair. I think man can love two women at once. Eights suck at this. If you back them into a corner and try to get them to show their cards philosophically, you're not going to get some articulate answer. Here's another one. Yeah, give him credit though. Shit, he worked the system. Deserves his freedom. Even the more actualized eights who dabble in justice and service will still handle a confrontation like, you bad, destroy. I'll talk about this more in the one video, but justice comes from the gut center. It's a type of impulse. And eights, nines, and ones will all exhibit that impulse very strongly. It's just that eights really don't filter it through anything. They just act. Eights are the easiest characters to write as purely impulsive. Like, I don't care what Cal Drogo's life philosophy is. I just want to see him kill dudes. Whereas you'd be hard pressed to write a three or a five who doesn't have some ongoing personal narrative about who they are and why everything is going to be okay. But at their lowest, eights will just shrug and say might makes right, if indeed they say anything at all. Don't mistype your characters for eights just because they're in power. Yes, eights are the type that pursues power for its own sake, but threes will come to power if it satisfies their self-esteem needs. Ones will come to power because they feel like they and only they are worthy. Head types will sometimes just accidentally stumble into positions of power, which is kind of funny. The eight as the protector is also common. Basically, that armor of don't mess with me can be extended out to other people. This is all well and good, but to squeeze narrative juice out of it, you have to look at the why. Is this really pure benevolence? What happens when the eights protected people become more powerful than the eight? A lot of time with eights, you'll get a sense of, you're my people and I protect you, but you have to stay weak and let me control you, okay? It's the classic man's man, domineering father. So to fully heal an eight complex means to be a servant, to completely surrender oneself to another person or to a cause. Visark in Arcane Season 2 seems to be headed this way. She's going to reluctantly join a system for the greater good. This is good for eights. The ability to submit themselves is a sign of growth. In terms of personality, eights tend to be the straightest of talkers, bordering on rude. In leadership situations, they typically don't have the social polish or persuasion abilities of threes, because on an instinctive emotional level, eights do not care if you dislike them. They're not looking for your approval. That's just not a factor in their brains. If they do have PR skills, obtaining those skills was almost certainly an uphill battle, which isn't to say that eights aren't smart. Intelligence is not a factor on the Enneagram. I've met more and less conscious people in every Every type. It's only to say certain forms of intelligence clash with certain type fixations. Nothing about strategy and planning run counter to eightness. Sucking up to a boss to get a promotion, though, that's not going to fly. Eights really do tend to occupy the stereotypical bad boy, bad girl archetype. Devil may care, impulsive, confrontational, you get it. You still have wiggle room in terms of presentation. Eights will present in ways that make them feel strong and in control. So maybe they got a fast car with a big engine. Maybe they got a punk thing going. Maybe they channel their anger in some unique way, like a musician. I didn't join a band so I could talk about my feelings. No. Joined it so I could hit my feelings with sticks. This is true of all types, but I just want to remind everybody that your Enneagram number is something you have, not something you are. So if you say, I'm going to make my protagonist an eight, you've simply taken the first step. You've decided on a few key moments for that character. But there are plenty of other choices you have to make that the Enneagram can't make for you. Their relationship with other characters, whatever melodrama you got going on, how they engage with the plot. It's just good to know their types. You have a guiding light to inform how they might react to all of that stuff, should you need it. Another thing that seems very eight-coded is revenge. Revenge is 
is tricky because while it does correspond to the gut center, it's not an Enneagram thing. Revenge is a tenth form of bullshit that can stand on its own narratively. Anybody can seek revenge. Revenge is a valid emotional core for a story. You don't need to weave other ideas and philosophies in. But in a story about a gut type, where the whole point of the character is that they need to stop following their gut, it's easy to frame revenge as an extension of the character's core bullshit. So yeah, overall, eights are one of the easier types to tell stories about, but I personally find eights more interesting in non-eight environments. The power war stories that I do consulting for are often very eight-coded, and I find myself getting bored at how everybody just wants power. In my opinion, if you're going to do a power war story, do it about a type that doesn't belong there, like a two. And if you want to tell an interesting story about an eight, put them in a non-eight environment, like the art world, or a political situation that would require some fakeness. Watching a character in their element is fun, but that's first act shit. You need to make your eight emotionally and psychologically uncomfortable if you want to explore the full depth of their humanity. That's eight. Okay, bye.